Welcome to Annette on Life, Liberty, and Happiness, a podcast where we talk about the Constitution, especially today. Yes. History, the culture, politics, anything else I feel like talking about. Um, this podcast can be found on AnnetteTalks.com, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, YouTube. All the major. Yeah, pretty much wherever you can find podcasts. All the reputable podcast apps. Because <laughs> if they ones? don't have it, then they're irreputable. <laughs> That's a good rule of thumb for you all <laughs> out there. Stay away from irreputable. I'm not sure irreputable is a word, but I will go with it. It should be. If it's <laughs> Disreputable. Um, <laughs> anyway, um... So, oh, and the other thing is if you're just listening and you want to see what we look like, go to YouTube, <laughs> youtube.com forward slash Annette Talks, and you can find it there. Or if you go to AnnetteTalks.com, you can see the link um, in the notes there. And as you can see, or hear in a minute, or you've already heard, <laughs> that, that I have DK Williams here with me again. I'm back. And um, he's my favorite and only um, constitutional expert. Oh, my goodness. Lawyer friend. Um. I have some other lawyer friends, but yeah. you're the one that's the Constitution expert. So I'm not sure if I've earned that uh, moniker, but I appreciate it. I think you have. All right. So you have. <laughs> right? Well, given that I've read it, and most people <laughs> haven't, I think that's a good starting point yes, for everyone. Yes, that's an excellent point. And it's jumping <laughs> off point to where what we're going to be talking about. And we are going to be talking about this book. A republic, if you oh, yeah. keep it. I proved that. I, you I had it too. It from mm-hmm. there. Yeah, we both had it. I got mine from the library, but I have now determined to buy it because right. it was so good. Yep. Um, by Neil Gorsuch, who is our current um, Supreme Court justice. He was um, nominated before Kavanaugh. Right? Correct. Yeah, because he, he sailed through in comparison to yes. Kavanaugh. Well, we won't go there <laughs> today. Um, but um, I wanted to talk about this book because it's hugely um, important. And especially with where we're at as a country right now. Yep. Um, and obviously the book title kind of gives away um, what it's about. But he uh, talks about the fact that we have this republic. And, and he talks about some of the things that are wrong with it, as we all acknowledge. Um, but he also talks about the things that we can be doing to maintain the freedoms that we have. Because as flawed as it is, it is still the best system on earth. And um, it still has, um, it still helps us to maintain the, the freedoms and liberties that we have. But it will not maintain itself. That's why it says, if you can keep it. Which is a reference to Benjamin Franklin. Yes, his Benjamin comment. Franklin, because it was, he was walking out of the Constitutional Convention and yep. he ran into a lady and she said, what, something like, what are you guys doing in there? What, are you <laughs> what, what did you give us? Right, yeah, what like did you that. give us? Right. right. And he says, a republic, if you can keep it. And that's a big if. Um, because obviously a republic doesn't keep itself. Um, if it wasn't a republic, it would be something else, like a monarchy, and we wouldn't have to worry about it, right? We could all just... Um, Do what we're told. Yeah, obey. And we're getting too close to that, in my view. Yes, and um, just to touch on that just a little bit, mm-hmm. um, I do want to give kudos to President Trump for the fact that he did get Gorsuch onto the bench. And there was one kind of cute story in there where... Um, he talked about how he wanted his wife up there with him when he was confirmed. Yeah, when he was being introduced. Was he being introduced? Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. And it wasn't in the uh, the plan at the time, and he was kind of bummed because he. Yeah, he wanted her up there with him. Yeah, he was really he's really yeah. tight with his wife, <laughs> as he should be, and obviously she helped to get him where he is. Um, and President Trump could see that that was an issue and invited her up right. and made that happen. Yeah. And so I was really touched by that. So I want to send uh, just. Off the bat, say kudos to President Trump for those two things. I so, will say that, yes, I, I think Gorsuch is an excellent Supreme Court justice, and Trump nominated him. So yeah. Good. So, if nothing else, if you don't like him for anything else, you've got to <laughs> at least acknowledge that. Um, and if you don't know much about Gorsuch, I recommend that you get the book, because I really didn't know that much. I knew he was from Colorado, mm-hmm. and I'm reading the book as a current Coloradan. <laughs> I've been here for seven years yeah, now. Right. Um, I felt some pride in the <laughs> that he came from here. And a little more pride in living in Colorado. When it's snowy, I'm not that happy about it. But, um, the, the main themes that I saw coming from the book, well, first he said that if you want to maintain a republic, you need to focus on civics and civility. And um, with civics being obviously education, as people don't know their constitution. And right. there were quotes in there about something like 25% of the people, let find it real quick here, something like, 25% couldn't name, um, 
only 25% could name the three branches of government, which is amazing to me because I thought everyone knew that. Um, and 33% could only name one branch. Um, and I thought, why, how are we at that place? But then he talked about not only um, understanding um, the Constitution and understanding the way the government works, but also participating right. and engagement. Um, and then the second one was civility. And um, he, just throughout the book, you get the sense that he is a very ethical, very kind, hardworking person, and that he um, really wants to pr propose that we all kind of be that person. Right. right. Especially yeah. lawyers. And uh, lawyers have to... Really yeah, he talks about how the adversarial nature of, the, of litigation, anyway. Um, can sometimes present the temptation to withhold something you're supposed to turn over, for example. Yes. And, you know, when he's talking about how how you are as a lawyer reflects who you are as a human being. And to keep that in mind when you have to make decisions. And you don't have to do everything your client tells you to do. Um, and, you know, I, I heard an old lawyer one time tell me when I was young that uh, he was a lawyer, not a bus driver. He didn't have to take everybody that wanted to get on the bus on it. Like a bus driver has to, but he didn't have to take everybody that came to ask him, you know, to represent him. Right. Um, and if somebody wants to ask you to do something that you d don't want to do, if it's unethical or for whatever, any other reason, you don't have to do it. You know, right. you, you got to be true to yourself, and that's um, important. And he mentioned that's what he, one of his themes when he talks to about um, talking to law students and, and lawyers in general. Yeah, I like he mentioned the golden rule many times yep. in the book, and so you, you just kind of get the sense of what a, a very decent um, human being he is. Yeah, he did come across that way, and, and genuine, and yes. genuine. Mm -hmm. um, and I just thought, it, yeah, I thought it was really cool the way he said, "You are in your professional life in this instance." Uh, lawyers, the same person you are in your personal life. You do not like go to work and leave your personal uh, ethics behind. You, you're the same person everywhere. And one of the interesting things that he um, he taught ethics in one of the law schools. Right. And one of the things that he made the students do is um, write their obituary. And they all didn't want to do it, but they did, and it made a difference because you're not going to look back on your life and say, "Boy, I wish I would have really." Um, done everything that my clients told me to do. Or made more money or, or, made, or yeah. you know, had more prestige or build more hours. Yeah, he said they had a bigger house, nicer yeah, car. Right. That's yeah. not the people are gonna want you want to be remembered for the impact you had on others and the you know the, in the community and how you treat other people is in essence. Those are things that people generally wanted to be remembered for. Right. Which if, if that's what you want to be remembered for those are the things you got to do. Yes. <laughs> and um, I have to apologize because I forgot to mention that you have your own podcast. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I need to remember that. <laughs> you I should have remembered that. Um, to, to, you got to pimp it out. got to plug it. Yeah. So you're an attorney. Yes. And um, you're currently practicing. But you, I think your real passion is what you do on the side, which is you have a podcast. I do enjoy it. Yep. I do. It's, it's almost every week. I've missed a few for holidays or whatever. But um, just did episode 64. And started in like September of 18. Uh, and it comes out usually every Thursday. So you can, if you follow me on Twitter or the, the podcast on Twitter, you'll get the links to them as they come out and some other information about uh, the Supreme Court or constitutional issues. And on Twitter, it's The Law, DKW, because the name of the podcast is The Law with DK Williams. And um, you can find it at Speakeasy Ideas. I'm affiliated with that, with that organization. And if you go to speakeasyideas.com slash the law, You'll find it. Um, and actually, well, you'll find it. And, um, <laughs> and I'll Google link it. to it yeah, in my yeah, show notes. Yeah, very good. Yep. So wherever you're, whichever reputable uh, podcast provider <laughs> you're going through, right. you should find it there. Exactly. It's on all of them. And, oh, just for example, like right now, I've been focused on, or last week, I was very much focused on Obamacare because the Fifth Circuit came out with the ruling upholding the district court ruling from last year, which I did a podcast on right after that came out, which it, in short, it says the individual mandate of the Affordable Care Act is no longer constitutional because when the Supreme Court upheld it, the sole reason they upheld it was based on Congress's power to tax. They didn't do it based on the Commerce Clause. They rejected that and the Necessary and Proper Clause, and that's a whole other argument. But they rejected every possible justification for the individual mandate except the power to tax. And it, it's cool. You know, the five to four majority said, yep, Congress can do this because of the power to tax. Well. The power to tax, or the, the tax in the individual mandate, is now gone. Right. So if the tax is zero, the district court in Texas and the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals out of New Orleans said, 
if the only legitimate constitutional basis is a tax and the tax is gone, there's no more constitutional basis for it. So I talked, get into that in a little more depth. And um, so has that gone to the Supreme Court? No, they right now they have uh, the, the losing states asked for an expedited hearing before the Supreme Court. The Fifth Circuit actually remanded it back to the Fifth Circuit for some um, um, severability issues. And the Supreme Court, when they got the request from the losers who want to keep it alive, they told the government and well, the states that want to get rid of it including Texas, that they needed to respond as to whether or not the Supreme Court should hear it to get in these procedural things, right? Um, on a much faster scale than normal or, or schedule than normal. They had to respond by Friday, which was yesterday, mm -hmm. by when we were posting this. And they said, no, there's no need to hear it any faster than normal. Because even if they heard arguments, I mean, they would have to do, do it very, very fast. Because normally, in a case like this that was appealed a week ago from the Court of Appeals, it's going to take months before the Supreme Court decides if they even want to hear it. And it's certain lot, they certainly would not have arguments and a decision this term. It would be a whole other year. So, so that right now, the question is whether or not they're going to expedite it, try to get a decision out basically by next summer, because that's yeah. when appeals come out. Yeah. So that's where they are on that. Um, and it ties in to the role of the judiciary. Get this segue. Yes. yes. Because, and one of the first things Gorsuch talks about in his book is what is the role of the judiciary? And as you mentioned, the three branches of government, you know, each have their own powers and authorities and checks on the other one. And the role of the judiciary is misunderstood by a lot of people today. And, um, one, and one partly of because quotes. of what you see in Hollywood and on yeah, TV. You get sure. the impression that judges can do whatever they want. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> that they're there to make policy, but right. they're not. And his quote about this was, he says, I came to realize that some today perceive a judge to be just like a politician who can and must promise and then deliver policy outcomes that favor certain groups. And then he goes on to say, that's not right. A judge should apply the Constitution or congressional statute as it is, not as he thinks it should be. And that is accurate. So when we get to uh, Obamacare now, the Affordable Care Act and the individual mandate, without, I, I can't think of an exception. I'm sorry, I've read everything, every criticism of the case, but I've read a lot of criticisms of the case saying, no, 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 the, the mandate is still okay, even though there's no more tax. Every single article is based on that author's belief that the policy is a good idea, uh -huh. that the individual right. mandate is worth it, and how horrible it will be if it goes away, with nary a mention of the actual legal issues. Right. They're arguing policy. This is a good policy. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the, the court should keep it going. That's a complete misunderstanding and, and worse of how the judiciary is supposed to work. So that's a good example, and it ties right in with um, uh, Gorsuch's book, and he makes that point and then does it very well. Right. I remember in law school, we did get to policy, but it was like at the end. Right. <laughs> like if you ran out of any other arguments, then you would argue policy. <laughs> right. With the raw, that's, that's and that's one. not, yeah, right. exactly. And he yeah. mentions that too. And there's a couple of cases where he said it was clear that the statute was against the party, but they were arguing that, well, this is what Congress would have done if they knew this was going to come up. And Gorsuch is like, well, maybe they would, but they haven't. They didn't. Right. The way it's written now, we have to uh, we have to apply it that way. If you want to go lobby the legislature to fix it, that's part of the process as well. Right. I mean, um, the, the huge point that I would say the main point, as, aside from the civics, um, not understanding the government and, and being a good person and being civil, which we can get to some more civility later, but it seems to me like the main thrust of this book was how important the separation of powers is. Right. And um, because he's a judge and because this is his background, he mainly talks about how judges are not supposed to be making law. Right. And the problems with that, um, I mean, there's some real obvious problems, um, but one of them, um, like Hamilton says, judge's job is to exercise merely judgment, not force or will should apply um, constitution or statute, constitution or statute as it is. They should apply the Constitution or statute as it is, not as they think it should be. Yep. And um, obviously the reason is because when you have people applying things the way they think it should be, they're making their own law, and also we don't know what the law is anymore because it's going to be whatever, whatever they say it is, they yeah. say it is at We that can't time. tell in advance uh, yeah. what they're going to say if they get to make it up every time. And, there's, and I teach a class on Pakistan, and so every term I see this country 
that has this huge problem with rule of law. And when you see a country with a problem with rule of law and the chaos that comes of it, then you can better appreciate, I mean, even though we have some problems with it here, not nearly what it would be if we didn't have a constitution and people like Justice Gorsuch who actually do. If we could have nine Justice Gorsuch, Gorsuches on our Supreme Court at any given time, I it would feel a lot. That would be okay with me. Yeah, yeah I would be, be all right that, with that. Follow what he, what he says. Oh, or Clarence but, Thomas, for that matter. I, yeah. I think he does it just as well. There was another quote that I wanted to find really quick. About. I'll hit one while you look for that. Okay. This is something that I use all the time or make reference to all the time in the uh, in my podcast, because I think it's, it's important and it goes right to the heart of what Gorsuch is talking about All here. Right. Judges aren't supposed to make policy, they apply the law. And this is from Justice John Marshall Harlan II, because the first one was a Supreme Court Justice, his grandfather. And he that was the lone dissenter in Plessy versus Ferguson, okay, his grandfather. Right. But Harlan too said in a, in a um, dissent to a case, the Constitution is not a panacea for every blot upon the public welfare, nor should this court be thought of as a general haven of reform movements. And yeah. to me, that is that should be like etched in marble over every appellate court. Right. Well, and and for one, I mean, one of the reasons was the way I just mentioned that you don't know what the law is at any given time, so you have no way of knowing if you're in violation of it. But also the method for making law mm -hmm. In legislature, he talks again and again about the fact that there's all sorts of compromise. Um, there's all sorts of research. You have representatives from every state yeah, in the legislative in, process, in, right. right? So all of this that goes into it, they come out with something that's supposed to be representative of the people, and and supposed to um, especially represent people that are in minority status that are not going to be um, represented otherwise. And so they come up with this law that has been, you know, there's been research. It's a long and process, and right? Made, and yeah, there's a whole process that went into it. And he talks about the importance of bicameralism because not only does yes. it all, you go through that entire process in the Senate, for example, then you have to go through that entire process in the House. Right. So it, it is hard to get legislation passed. Yes. And that's the point. Purposely, it's supposed right. to be hard. To, and, and then, then presentment. Right. Then you have to give it to the president, and then he has to sign off on it as well, and he can veto it, and then you got that process. Right. But that entire process is supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be like hammering something out, right? You're, you're like a blacksmith forging something with all this different input and all these different pe interested people, and whatever you come up with, that's what the judiciary interprets. Right. That's the idea. And he talks about the different tools, because sometimes legislatures all too often are vague. They, they mm -hmm. write something as a result of that process where the legislatures don't want to take a stand on something, so they, they kind of make it vague. Uh, oh, that's the result anyway. And one of the tools he mentions that I in complete agreement with him on, and I mentioned this also so in the podcast, is how useless, generally speaking, legislative history is. Yes. Because what will happen is, because you've got, like you said, in um, Congress you've got 535 members, I think that's right, right. Uh, 100 senators, 435 congresspeople. They go through this entire process with committees and they go back and forth and, and what they come up with is what they come up with. That is what they agreed on. And if there's an issue about, well, what does this mean at this part of it? And then people go into the legislative history to do that. So people love to do this. They love it. What you get there is one of those 535 people saying, this is what I think. Right. And then, oh, well, th that's what the statute means, right? Th that's how the argument goes. Well, this guy said it means this, and he was in the legislative process. Therefore, that's what it means. Right. And Gorsuch is like, that's one guy out of 535. The only way that they all spoke, or a majority of them spoke, was through what they wrote in that statute, not what that guy said. Right. And they didn't pass the legislative history. Right. They passed that right. statute. Right. Oh, well, and, and also, these are all elected people that have made this law. Yep. Judges, As yeah, that ju elected, are not, the, the legislature. They're not generally right. worrying about their next election, and so there's a reason it was made this way. Mm -hmm. And even the bicameralism. What was it? The quote from um, George Washington um, talked about. Uh, was it? Was he talking to Jefferson? And Jefferson said, "You know, why? Why do we need to have two houses?" And um, they were drinking tea, and hmm. Jefferson had poured his tea from his cup into his saucer. I guess tea drinkers do this. <laughs> and Washington said, why did you pour that cup into your saucer? And he said, to let it cool. He said, well, that's the same reason you have two houses, that you need to let the 
legislation cool a bit coming out of the House into the Senate. And the Senate is supposed to be very deliberative, which is why it's smaller, right. fewer people. They can spend more time on it. But it goes to this huge, long, drawn out, difficult, purposely difficult yeah. process. So they can't get mad at something today, pass something today, and next week it's an effect. Right. The, yeah, the, like you're saying, the point is they have to think about it longer than that before yeah. it can become an effect. And they, you have to, you have to listen to your constituents while that's what you're supposed to be doing. Right. And hopefully represent your people, your people's interests mm -hmm. when you right. go to vote on something. Right. Where, compare that to one judge or a panel of three. Right, yep. Or even the nine, he talks yeah. about on the, on the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, and the point he makes is that, frequently in the book, he, makes, he talks about how even people that sometimes want the Supreme Court to do something, to, to act as a reform, a haven for a reform movement, right? Mm -hmm. Fix this social ill because Congress hasn't done it. So you, Supreme Court, you fix it, uh -huh. which happens all the time. That, that, that argument is made, and the Supreme Court has done that. Oh, yes. Um, he's like, well, if you give the Supreme Court the power to do that on your issue, if, you, if you're okay with it on your issue, somebody's going to use it on another issue that maybe you don't agree with. Maybe you're happy with the way the situation is. And who would you rather be in control of those topics, the entire legislature or these nine justices? Right. And he says, you don't want the nine justices doing that. It's not their role, and even in, it's just a bad idea. So don't ask for that. Don't think that's what is a good idea, because it's not. Right. You know, sometimes things aren't the way you want them to be, and um, you can't make them be the way you want to be. That's what living just, in a society is. Yeah, and he says that's one of the things that judges have to, to accept is that a lot of times they're going to make decisions that they don't like. Right. Because they don't like the law or they don't like the facts. Yeah, they disagree they, with the policy. Yeah. And he, he mentions how a judge who was happy with every decision he ever wrote wouldn't be a very good judge because he would have to impose his philosophy or his um, uh, policy beliefs into his decisions. And that's not what they're supposed to do. So sometimes a judge is going to write an opinion or join an opinion where he thinks it's bad policy, right. but it's what the law requires. So, and it goes back to the, to the Affordable Care Act. You might think it's awesome policy, but if the constitutional linchpin has been pulled from the statute, it's not constitutional anymore, right. no matter how good the policy is. So. Or bad. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 exactly, <laughs> exactly. But, um, uh -huh. Right, and, and so as I was reading this, until it got to a point where he started talking about administrative agencies, I kept thinking, oh, yes, yeah. Yeah. you know, I, I was sitting there thinking that, you know, if I were, if I had a magic wand and I could make changes um, to uh, better get us back on Federal track where we should yeah. be, yeah. Uh, one of the first things would be to get rid of the administrative agencies. Absolutely. Uh, because of this very problem, they're part of the executive branch, yep. right, which is not the legislature. Correct. And it's supposed to be the, they're supposed to execute laws, the executive branch. And, but you've got all these agencies and you have, I remember law school, there was a um, administrative law class I could have yeah. taken and I was just not interested because <laughs> it just, it just, uh, it said to me, yuck, yeah. there shouldn't be administrative judges. Right. Because, because how can you have an executive branch with someone who's um, they're all three. doing a judicial, they're judicial all three. job. Because right? the, the administrative agency will write regulations, which is legislation, mm -hmm. both to be based on what Congress tells them, which is their, with, within their authority. So the administrative agency is writing regulations, which is legislative. Mm -hmm. They are enforcing an, the laws, which is the executive. And then they've got judges to try these issues. Right. So they are all three things in one body, which is the antithesis of the way the U.S. Yes. government was formed. And it creates a whole lot of problems. And Gorsuch has written about it, and I think he would like to undo a lot of it. And I've seen some several progressive types uh, wail about that possibility. I read mm -hmm. there was an article in the New York Times about some justice. I don't think it was Gorsuch, but same idea. It's like he said that almost all the federal government is unconstitutional, and they were just like, "That's the end of the world." If we, you know, it's the end of the world if that happens. But it's not. And yeah. you know, if Congress wants to make something illegal, it's their job to do it, not right. to pass it off to an administrative agency to do it. And one reason they do it is because they don't want to take the heat. They, they say, oh, we're just yeah. going to let the administrative agency do that. Right. It's not us, that's them. Yes. Well, you created that to take away the heat from you on a lot of issues. Well, and guess what? They're supposed to take the heat. Yeah. That's the yeah. whole point. Right. They're the elected right. officials. Mm -hmm. And so the problem is you get stuck in an administrative agency. You don't have any recourse. Right. And there you're supposed to, and he talked about the legislation, I can't remember what it's called, administrative agency regulation or whatever. Um, I think it's the, the APA, it's, the Administrative 
Policy Act? Yeah, that sounds like right. That. Something like that. Um, and it's supposed to give you um, the, the ability to appeal to an actual court if you don't like what happens, but right. that almost never happens. Um, and, and it costs money. I mean, that's part of yeah. it. It costs money and time to go through the administrative process and then go, okay, well, now let's go to the courts. You know, right. it's, it, it, it has a very real cost. Yeah. And, and he said that the, even within the agency, uh, when they were first set up by the APA, yep. that they were allowed to either go with the formal or informal um, procedures. Right. And so, of course, they're all, they've all kind of Done. slid down into the informal. Because it's easier. So, right? there's, and there's less due process. Administrative Procedure Act. Oh, okay. All right. That, I think that was what it was. Whatever I said before. It's, right. a, it's in the book. So, <laughs> if you guys are really interested. Um, right. But, right. I did a podcast on Chevron, which is oh, you did? Yeah, which yeah, is in the book. an issue about that. Yeah, right. Don't want to get into the weeds on that. Believe me. Yeah, uh, there and and fortunately, this book doesn't get into the weeds too much. No, it doesn't. It's very general and talks about general ideas, which are foundational to to then go into the weeds, which right. is important. Well, and you know, we're supposed to understand what's going on in our country. So if you feel like you're lacking in that <laughs> regard, find the book, read the book. Yeah. yeah. Um, but. I was thinking I would get rid of administrative agencies yeah. altogether. And well, the thing is, if, if the federal government is so reliant on them, that doesn't that say something about the size of the federal government yep. and the problem? And maybe we should be pushing a lot of this down to the states, which we'll be talking about in another yeah. episode at another time. Yeah, I did Wickard versus Filbert, episode five of the law with D.K. Williams, which is one of those cases that you love to hate right. in law school. Right. <laughs> but um, And in short, with that, sorry. So right. in short, yeah. what that says is, Congress, according to the Constitution, has the power to regulate commerce among the states, interstate commerce. And Worker v. Filburn said that, I'm not making this up, they said that if, even if it's not commerce and it's not between two different states, that's still interstate commerce. If it has an effect some right. way right. on commerce. Because in the case, wasn't a guy growing wheat in his He was own. growing wheat and he was consuming it entirely on his own right. farm. He wasn't even selling it. So it wasn't commerce and it wasn't interstate, yet... The U.S. Supreme Court said Congress had the power to regulate his activity because it affected interstate commerce. If everybody did that, and it, that's just a that's just a complete rewrite of the Constitution. That's not what it meant, and it, it was just a huge, it was a usurpation of power by the federal government from the states. And but that that's been overturned or narrowed or no, it's gotten wider. Oh. No, we could have gotten wider. Yeah. yeah, this is a problem, people. Um, and there was, uh, there was another, oh, so he, administrative agencies, we could do away with. Um, also, he talks about, he spends a lot of time on originalism and textualism. Right. And um, the only difference being really that originalism applies to the Constitution and right. textualism applies to statutes. But basically, and I, again, if all judges and justices w would adhere to this, we would be in so much better shape. But it basically says that you look at the actual verbiage of the Constitution or the statute and you look to see what it meant at the time that it was passed. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> you know, you that's, look to that's legislative crazy talk. history. That's crazy talk. Yeah, I know, really. Do what the, do what the statute says? <laughs> Why, that's just insane. That will hurt me from being able to impose policy on people, and I know good policy. <laughs> so I think that's a horrible idea. Yeah. That's, that's the... And he, he um, quoted someone, okay, so this goes along with the idea of is the Constitution living or dead, right? And um, he's a big fan of Scalia, and so obviously we, if you know your Supreme Court justices at all, then you know that Scalia does not believe in a living Constitution, um, that it meant what it meant what it, when it was written, and it still means what it meant when it was written, and yet you still have to go back and, and um, apply what it means, what it meant then, now. Anyway, but he said that what's your alternative is um, you have people that argue for things like pragmatic constitutionalism, right. progressive constitutionalism, constitutional, constitutionalism, and postmodern constitutionalism. So the point was you could come up with a whole list of different ways to um, interpret the Constitution. And obviously that begs the question then, well, which one would you go with? Because someone's got to make that decision. So if there are all these different options versus going with what the Constitution actually says, hmm, which one is going to get you a similar or the same result most of the time? He says, you know, even yeah. originalists can, can debate with each other, but they're debating on the actual text and what it means as opposed to what policy do they right. want to promote. Yeah, what he, outcome? You're not supposed to look for output or outcome. 
because that's the legislature's job. Yes. And, and this separation of powers is an important thing. And he, he talks about uh, Judge Richard Posner a couple times, mm -hmm. who's a, a court, circuit court judge, and he's very well respected. He's written a lot of things, but he's not an originalist or a no. textualist. And Gorsuch does a good job of explaining the bad outcomes if you follow somebody like Posner, who thinks that if there's a close call, the judge should consider the <laughs> the social impact of the decision. Right. And um, and Posner basically says we're like we're smart people, so it's okay <laughs> to trust us with this. Right. And that's the opposite of what the judiciary is supposed to do. Right. And so that's that's this quote that I wanted to bring up. It's from the dissent in Dred Scott, and he brings up. Dred Scott is an example of a really bad law that comes from um, activism, yeah, from judicial departing activism. from right. originalism and trying to, you know, make the outcome that you want. Um, and this is from Justice Curtis, his dissent. This is when a strict interpretation of the Constitution, according to the fixed rules which govern the interpretation of laws, is abandoned, and the theoretical opinion of individuals are allowed to control its meaning, we have no longer a Constitution. Yeah. We are under the government of individual men who, for the time being, have power to declare what the Constitution is according to their own views of what it ought to mean. Yeah, right. And that's exactly like, yeah, what? There's no rule of law. It's, again, I have to bring up my Pakistan example because I teach this every term and it comes up again and again. And they have a constitution, but they're constantly mm -hmm. suspending it and um, yeah. amending it like so easily. And, right. and so it always begs the question in class. I always have to ask them, well, what's the problem with this? What what is the point what of we, even yeah. having a constitution? You can't rely on it yeah. from day to day. If it's always changing, right? Then it's not really a constitution. Yeah, so you might as well it's not, not have one. one. Right. So right. Um, I'm, yeah. that's so cost, originalism and textualism um, are the other two big arguments that he makes that go along with the separation. Um, they go hand in hand. It's amazing to me that people don't see that. Right. They, they they absolutely do. How do you not? You know? Right. And because I mean, there are uh, there's a school of thought out there that. They want the U.S. Supreme Court or the Court of Appeals to implement policy. Policy they can't get passed through Congress because that's hard to do like it's supposed to be. But they want the U.S. Supreme Court to be able to do these things. They want the U.S. Supreme Court to make policy, to uphold um, legislation because it's a good idea, even if it's not constitutional. The Constitution gets in the way of these brilliant people's plans. Right. And when the Constitution gets in the way with these planners' um, brilliance, they want to ignore the Constitution. And which is exactly what happened in Wickard v. Filburn. Because FDR and the New Deal uh, and the legislature had created all these programs with no legitimate constitutional authority, but they're like, these are great ideas, man. Mm -hmm. We can't let the Constitution stop us from implementing these ideas. Right. And that's a lot of people that believe that. And, and Gorsuch and others, Clarence Thomas among them, um, are saying, no, that's not the way this is supposed to work. And um, unfortunately, that other school of thought has gained a tremendous amount of power. Right. Well, which is why it's nice to see Gorsuch coming out with this book and um, him being a current Supreme Court justice um, gives me some hope. But it also reminds me back to the um, discussion about the administrative agencies and there are so many of them out there, um, that they actually make uh, something like 18 regulations for every law. That's not, <laughs> right. so, you can't, they're uncountable. And yeah. of course, it talks about that. All the regulations, it's in the hundreds of thousands, and you, nobody knows the number because you can't count them. Right. They, cha they get changed all the time uh, and yeah, added to and changed. I would just do away with those. Yeah. Or, or like he talks about maybe there's got to be some regulation, some further regulation on them. Well, um, that's Congress. That should be Congress. Yes, Congress, Congress should be should, doing that. Congress should just pass the laws. If they, you know, if the snail darter needs to be protected, that shouldn't be up to an administrative agency. That should be Congress. Yes. And they should have legitimate constitutional authority to do whatever they're going to do, right. not just do things because it's important. Because if you think something's important, somebody else thinks something else is important, and yes. there has to be some kind of baseline to determine what can be done. And frankly, I, I had to tell clients this before. Yeah, you were wronged. Um, and the judicial system doesn't have any remedy for you. Yep, uh, life is not fair. Yeah. And when people try to make it fair by adding more rules, mm -hmm. giving people more power, there's so many unintended consequences to that, yeah. which they overlook. And it's important not to overlook those things, because for every law you pass, you're forcing somebody to do something. Right. I don't think people, it's, in, they, it's like they don't realize. Yeah. What, when, whenever you 
create a power over here, somebody else is losing it. Yeah, over here, Someone else is losing yeah, it. Over individuals here. always. Yeah. Lose so power. the bigger right. government gets, right. the smaller your freedoms get. Yes. Um, which reminds me, of what we were talking about before uh, we started recording about how everyone over eighteen has committed commits. Felonies. Oh yeah, there's a great book, um, Three Felonies a Day: How the Feds Target the Innocent by Harvey Silvergate, and he's basically there's so many felonies or federal laws and felonies in particular uh -huh. that nobody can know if they're breaking them or not. And there's so many that are so ridiculous that cover, they're vague also, that's part of it. Hmm, maybe that does, is covered by that statute. And so he submits his premises that you go, you get up and you go out as an adult and come back at home, you probably committed three federal felonies. <laughs> right. Yeah. I wouldn't right. be surprised. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and Gorsuch talks about how, you know, we've, we've swung so far from the other direction, like the Magna Carta was created because we didn't have any rule of law from no law, no written law, because judges used to give like verbal yep. um, in, in the UK. Uh, decisions. Right. So it wasn't even written. So no written law to way too much law. That There's no way you can actually know yep. what the law is. Mm -hmm. And that's a big problem. And then um, a few of the other issues that he talked about, um, which I thought were interesting because he's addressing um, the legal system and judges are, and lawyers, how um, access to justice, because we're all supposed right. to have it and how in reality we don't always have it. Right. He says, you know, a lot of, um, like when he was first um, clerking or practicing law, he couldn't afford his own. Right, um, couldn't afford to hire himself. Yeah, he couldn't afford to hire himself. <laughs> and I, I understand that because when I was estate planning, I thought I couldn't afford my yeah. own services. <laughs> right. And right. it's not right. And and some of the reasons behind that um, can be, they can be addressed. Like Yeah, he our, mentions it. He, he offers possible solutions. Right. And right. one of them goes with the, the episode that I'm going to post before this episode. So if you haven't listened to my episode on why college is so expensive, go back and listen to that. Yeah. Um, one of them is about accreditation in right. law school. Yep. And, and so the same thing applies to undergrads as it does to law school. But how the ABA, um, you know, every college. The American Bar If you want to go to law, law school, right, which is different from the APA. Uh, yes, anyway. exactly. Um, the American Bar Association accredits law school, and if you want to take the bar, you've got to go to an ABA accredited school. And so yeah, they've got there might all be a state these, or two that are, are don't, that doesn't apply to, but almost every state right. you have to do that. Right. Was it California? No. It, well, no, in California you can be state bar approved. Right. And uh, Cal Bar, because I know that because when I started yeah. at my law school, we didn't have any accreditation. Yeah. We were like. All right. Fingers right. crossed, and so we got Cal Bar approved before I left. So I lucked out. But, um, <laughs> but generally speaking, you generally have to go speaking, to one of these you schools. have to go. To, but and my school was um, all those things that you have to be. You know, it's a three year. Um, it's you've got to have a certain number of full time professors. Right. You can't have. I mean, just you have to have a full time librarian. Right. Not a part time librarian. Yeah. You have to have a full time. That's one of the things that you have to have to be accredited. Right. So your students can graduate and then take the bar. Lots of things that sound that, like nice yeah. ideas. Yeah, things but, that cost money that add to the price. Right. And so us lawyers come out with huge um, student loan debt, and so you know we've got to charge. It. I mean, let's not say all of them don't, but yeah. I just quit an economics because that's one thing I even made a note of in the book. He says one of the reasons why you're charged so much is that it costs so much to go to law school. Mm -hmm. That's not exactly right. I, it doesn't matter how much your inputs cost. I mean, I could, you know, if I want to sell bottled water, but it costs me ten dollars a bottle. How much it costs me doesn't matter because people aren't going to spend that much on it. Yeah, so it, it's part of it is. I, so if there's not a, a a market for lawyers at that price, that price isn't going to exist. Right. Well, that's the other thing he talks about is supply and demand. Right, right. And I think he had a few good points here to how uh, the 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 um, regulation by the ABA again about that um, makes it cost more. Um, yeah. What's it? What is it? Um, practicing law without a license. Unauthorized basically. practice of yes, law. Yes. Thank you. Unauthorized. Yeah. And um, how. You can go to you can go to jail. I'm guessing right. or at least get fined big time for it. Um, and so you have to be a lawyer to be able to practice law. And then they don't even really know what practicing law right. means. The definition is very big. But if other people could help you right. um, navigate the law system, legal system, absolutely. They, and you could pay them less than two hundred, three hundred dollars an hour. Absolutely. Um, and you could go, you would have more access to the law. Yeah, like yeah. Right now, if I was picked up and I had to go hire someone. Yeah. Right, right. And I'd have to go into law he, debt. He's got a good, several good examples of how they do things in the United Kingdom that make things more accessible, yes. to, and then we can maybe do some of those things. Right. And one of the things he talks about is, like, law firms cannot um, be associated with a partner who's not a lawyer. So, for example, it might make sense for lawyers to have a partnership with accountants. Right. 
or you know, any other letters, number of examples. Yeah, right. All sorts of things like but that. But that you can't do that because lawyers it's, I mean it is a it's a protectionist policy. Yes, it lawyers is. Lawyers want to protect themselves um, and keep competitors out. I mean that's that's what it is. Every professional licensing is that. It really is. Right. That's a whole other thing. Milton Friedman. Well, and I can that. see, you know, part of the problem is because mm -hmm. a lot of them are out there sitting out there on two hundred thousand dollar debt or whatever, and so they're thinking if if uh, all of a sudden there's a bunch of competition and their salary goes down way down, they can be able to pay that. So yeah, no, absolutely. It's against their best interest, right. which I can understand. Right. However, it's not in the best interest of people system. of the consumer. <laughs> right. Yes, the consumer. The consumer has got to be. You you can't not be able to get uh, access to good legal counsel and advice and yeah. help, especially if you're sitting in a criminal case um, or a civil case where the, the fines are potentially huge. Yeah. I mean, you right. just, you've got to be able to have access to that. And so, yeah, he had some good ideas um, that I'd like to see. As also, letting lawyers sit for the bar without law school. Right. And Why not? Bar, if, you can, right. if you can study on your own and, and do the <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you talk about Abraham Lincoln. Even until the early 1900s, there were famous lawyers that didn't go to law school. Oh, yeah. Usually, they would work with another lawyer for a while, and that's right. probably a better way to learn. Which I would yeah. I would rather have done. I would right. rather have sat at home and read a bunch of stuff and then gone and worked with lawyers. Because you don't learn how to practice law in law school. That's no. a little known secret. <laughs> no. You learn how to read cases and analyze and yeah. argue, but you don't learn how to practice law. Right. So so there are a lot of other ways that could, you know. One of the things that I really thought about that would make the access to law much more affordable is letting lawyers work for non-lawyers to get paid by non-lawyers. Yeah. And the example of that is that pop up to my mind is why? Because you'll see like H and R Block or whatever at a Walmart, and you'll right. see veterinarians at the um, the the pet store. Right? They'll have an office mm -hmm. in there. You can't do that if you're a lawyer. The, right. the rules prohibit you from working for somebody who's not a lawyer. I mean, it ha that is your boss. I mean, your clients are lawyers, but you know what I mean? You can't have the boss of you not be a lawyer. And so that means somebody can't set up a shop in Walmart right. and have people come in for a much cheaper rate <laughs> to talk about what their issues are. I was just thinking what that would be like. Yeah, <laughs> oh, it would be a very different type of practice. It would be. And, but it, it would be meeting a need, and a lot of people yes, wouldn't be able would. to help. I mean, like I was saying, sometimes you got to tell people, yeah, that's horrible. The law can't do anything about it. And a lot of people can't have a hard time believing that. Yeah. Well, so there's something <laughs> that true. Can, there's a lot that can be done about it. But yeah, you've got to, the ABA is going to have to go along with that. And, right. And, like you said, right. and the legislatures would, right. would as well to make that happen. Yes. Um, there's absolutely no reason that, that people shouldn't be able to, to work for a corporation that's, you know, the law is us or whatever. Right. Yeah. Well, and I never liked working for law firms anyway. Right. Yeah. So I, I would welcome that if I was going to go back to law practice. And, and, uh, and the licensing, it also goes with, let some things be done by non-lawyers. I mean, wills don't have to be done by a lawyer. Right. For most people. I mean, if you got a billion dollars, yeah, you want somebody who knows all the tax ramifications and everything else. But if you don't have all that, it's no reason to hire a lawyer to write you a will. Right. I mean, that's what and you talked about legal Zoom and things like that. Mm -hmm. There are places to go that will meet your needs for much cheaper. And right. he talks about how when legal Zoom first came out, or what was what's the there's a couple of them rocket rocket lawyer yes yeah, so. so when they first come out do you, bars like hey no you guys can't do that right. that's uh, that is the unauthorized practice of law and they won a couple of those and a couple of states they couldn't do their thing I think they all can now but you can see the incentive for lawyers to keep cheaper alternatives out of the marketplace right. and that is completely wrong. That's and just as a plug for estate planning lawyers, yeah, <laughs> legal soon really. won't won't meet the needs for everyone. That's for sure. But there is a, a fairly significant um, part of the population that I think would be well served by them. And with other things too, you know, there's no reason to pay a lot of money to set up um, an LLC for right. you or anything like and, that. And if you've got a paralegal or somebody, what we call a paralegal now, that knows how to search deeds, you know, there's no need. You can't have some no reason you can't have someone who's not an actual lawyer close your house. Right. So yep, there are a lot lots, of things that yeah. can be done by non-lawyers. Yeah. And, and divorces, and, divorces too. Yeah, and they talked about the fact he talked about the fact that specialization was more important than um, licensure. So I mean, if you because you have someone that's like say a paralegal who's been working for a um, divorce attorney mm -hmm. for twenty years, they probably know better than the attorney does. They probably they certainly doing, know more than a first year, you know, first year lawyer. Oh yeah, for sure. They're gonna know a lot more than that person. So yeah, there's a lot of reform that can be done there to change that. So all right. What else do we on, want to say? On precedent, because, because he talks about precedent. Oh, yes, precedent. precedent. That's one of your, that's right. I'll let you take the lead on this one, because this is your buddy. Um, and I, last term, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court 
overrule two prior U.S. Supreme Court cases. And the progressives, and it doesn't always break it down that way, and I hate making that um, like an assumption, like that's all, it's always the conservative versus the progressive, because it's not. But in these two cases, that's how it worked out. And they were very concerned, the dissents were concerned about the court overturning precedents. And there's a subtext to all of this, and that's Roe versus Wade. Because um, there's and there's articles on this out there, um, and a lot of people, a lot of quote unquote progressives, are afraid that the Supreme Court will eventually overturn that, and that's exactly what some of these legislatures ah. want. Like Georgia and uh, Alabama. I didn't realize sure. that was the driving. Yeah, concern. right. So they're like, don't, don't. Every precedent is so important. Um, <laughs> Because, I mean, some states are trying to get it up to the Supreme Court and, and hope that it will be overturned. And that's a whole other thing. But that's what they are trying to do. And the issue of when should the Supreme Court overturn its prior rulings, you know, th that's a good good question. Yeah. I mean, because you, you, you do want to have that consistency. Right. But you also don't want a wrong case to be still the law. I mean, like right. Plessy versus Ferguson is overturned by... Brown versus Board of Education, and Korematsu, where the U.S. Supreme oh, Court said it was okay to round up the Japanese people in World War II, um, that was only, a I mean, everybody knew that wasn't right for a long time, but it wasn't like officially overturned until recently. Right. So, so you got to overturn stuff sometimes, we know that, but then it's the opposite, uh, it, it, do you say that we should do it all the time? You know, if we just think, you know what, those guys are wrong, I, I think we should do it this way, because there's, but there's a cost to that, mm -hmm. and um, one of the things that course which mentions in here is that the power of precedent includes then the power to enshrine wrong decisions and I think Thomas has done a good job of, about this about saying yeah that's a bad idea mm -hmm. if it's a wrong decision it should be fixed right um, and just and I think some of this concern about precedent you see right now by some of the, the uh, progressive commentators let's say not not so much the, the, the justices but the commentators they are throwing this fit about precedent being overturned, but they can be kind of selective in that, uh, right? right? I mean, because if Citizens United came up, they'd be arguing to overturn it. <laughs> right. So, exactly. you know, I, you got to kind of look through some of the, some of the subtext sometimes and um, uh, But he, look he has a good decision, I mean, he has a good discussion in the book about that, because there are, there's arguments on both sides, so you have to look right. at it. Right, yeah. And, but in Absolutely. law school, yeah, it was kind of... We, we learned is starry, is it starry decisis? Starry decisis. I always, That's I, yeah. I, it took me a long time to figure out. Which just means precedent, that, right. Right, which, but it, we were kind of given the impression that that was um, a hard and fast rule that you had to follow precedent. But what he's, in the book he talks about it being judicial policy. Right. So well, lawyers have to abide by it. And right. trial judges have to abide by it. It's right. only the, the Supreme Court that really can overturn right. it itself. But you, you get the impression that the Supremes are never supposed to overturn anything. Mm. And that's just not the case. Yeah. So um, I, I like that he has this discussion that goes both ways because you do want to have, you do want the law to be settled. Right. So you do want to know what the law is. But like he says, they have the power to um, distinguish or overturn when law is bad law. Right. And like there was the other one that's still, it was a baseball. Was oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The no. National, Federal, Federal Baseball League versus Major League Baseball, that's not it, but it's something like that. Uh -huh. Where Oliver Wendell Holmes said that baseball was not interstate commerce. This is like the ex other extreme with interstate yeah, commerce. Yeah, I know. Right. I was like, how? Yeah, and what? that's one of the reasons this is so... Uh, I mean, baseball, like, it's in every state yeah. and all these right. cities. And like, right. so. so he said it wasn't subject to the Antitrust Act passed by Congress because it was not interstate. It was just a baseball game right here in this locality, and that's it. And, and <laughs> Which is so funny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so that's still officially... Um, binding Supreme Court precedent, and what the Supreme Court has said in a couple of occasions is, well, yeah, we screwed that up, yeah. but Congress can fix it if they want to. Uh, didn't Congress fix it at something? Didn't they make their own, didn't they make it carve they've out They've changed it. They, yeah, they they've, changed it. Anyway. they've changed it. So anyway, it's a good discussion on precedent. Yes. If you're interested in that, you want to read that. Um, but I, I think he was right. There's a place for it, but on the other hand, you can't leave bad lots sitting there forever just right. because it's bad Yeah, and it's a good discussion. When, when do you overturn it, when do you not? Right. Um, and since I mentioned Citizens United, because that's something that I, I really feel strongly about, because nobody knows, almost nobody, who criticizes it is honest about what it says. And I, went, I when I first started doing my law podcast, that was the second one I did, because I wanted to, to talk about it. So Citizens United, episode two of mm -hmm. The Law with D.K. Williams. 
All it says is that the government can't censor a documentary. And so if you oppose Citizens United, you think the government should be able to censor a documentary. I'm not making it up. It's true. I feel like Richie Gervais. Ah, yeah. It's well, true. It's true. listen to it's episode true. two of The Law. We'll get into more, more into that. Yes. So it's, um, is there anything else? Big uh, man, I think we hit most that? of the bullet points. All right. it, it's a good book. It's a really good read. I, I have to be honest. And it's basic. It's not written for lawyers or No, no. It's, it's very accessible. People. Right. Very accessible. Um, and I think something that everyone should be familiar with. Um, so uh, I have to be honest, that actually brought me to tears in a few places um, because it's just like, he, you know, he talks about how things are not great he, and there, things can change and should be made, but how much uh, appreciation he has for the system and um, how much hope he has for it. And um, he's got pictures of his, his grandparents <laughs> and parents and just, you know, you just get a really good sense of what a decent man he is, um, how much hope he has for the country and his, um, his bedrock values. And if, if we were all more like Justice Gorsuch, you know, what a great country this would be. So it's really worth the read. Totally recommend it. Again, A Republic If You Can Keep It by Neil Gorsuch. I got it at the library. I'm going to buy it now. I got it for Amazon because I like mark it up a lot. I know. That's the only bummer about having a library book. Yeah, highlights to, and everything. I had to make yeah. all these notes of everything. That's on every page because I'm like, I can't mark it up. I almost never buy them, but I'm going to buy this one. So go find it. Read it. Um... Go find the law with DK. Yeah, here. law with DK Williams. And, yep. um, and on Twitter, the law DKW. Yes, he likes to tweet. His tweets are fun. Well, I have separate two separate accounts. I got a personal account, which is at Blue Carp, with like the color of the fish. But I try to keep the law with D, the law DKW um, strictly legal type issues. Right. right. Well, so. follow them both. Yeah. You know. <laughs> I don't listen. I don't. I don't read many tweets, but I usually read his and ah, I'm sometimes under. even I'm retweet. Under. <laughs> um, all right, so thank you for listening. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Always a pleasure. Yes, thank you. He'll be back again many times. <laughs> um, again, you can find this podcast at AnnetteTalks.com, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, yada, yada. Um, YouTube, please subscribe on YouTube. Please subscribe on my website. Find me on Facebook, um, Annette Talks. Uh, discuss. I want your feedback. Um, I want to know what you think about this and anything else and what else you want to hear about on the podcast. Um, I want this to be more of an interactive. Like, subscribe, and share. Yeah. Thank you. I always forget <laughs> to say that. Thing. All right. So thank you for listening um, to Annette on Life, Liberty, and Happiness. All right. Knocked it out.